Good afternoon, and welcome to our dialogue, our discussion today on the topic of God and the cosmos. Um, I am honored to introduce our two panelists, our two speakers, who will be um, giving us um, some introduction to the work that they do and the perspective that they have on uh, their subjects. And so I have the honor of introducing these folks. Um, Dr. Deborah Hasmer um, is currently the president of Biologos, and uh, she earned her PhD in physics at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. Um, she has made a career of interpreting complex scientific topics for lay audiences and often speaks to churches, colleges, and schools about the relationship between science and the Christian faith. She has written two books, uh, Origins, uh, Christian Perspectives on Creation, Evolution, and Intelligent Design. Uh, the, that one is with her husband and fellow physicist, Lauren Hasmer. Um, and it's a book that presents the agreements and disagreements of Christians regarding the history of life and the universe. Uh, a second book is an anthology entitled Delight in Creation, Scientists Share Their Work with the Church, which she co-wrote with Reverend Scott Hosey. Um, she has previously served as the professor and chair in the Department of Physics and Astronomy at Calvin College and has numerous publications on extragalactic st astronomy and cosmology. Our second uh, panelist is Father Paul Gabor, um, who is originally from Slovakia. Um, he originally studied particle physics at the Charles University in Prague in the Czech Republic. And uh, his initial work was primarily instrumental, and he participated in the development of detectors for the Large Hadron Collider in CERN um, uh, in Geneva. Um, he entered the Society of Jesus in 1995 and did his Novitate in the Czech Republic and then followed up with two years of philosophy in Krakow. After this, he taught philosophy for a year and studied theology in Paris, was ordained to the priesthood in 2004, and then after that earned a PhD in astrophysics in 2009 in Paris, where he continued his work on instrumentation with Alain Leger, the uh, author uh, of the proposed Darwin Space Observatory at the time. And uh, his work was carried out at the Institut d'Astrophysique Spatiale at the University of uh, Paris and focused on two optical test beds that came out of it. Father Gabor joined the Vatican Observatory in September of 2010 and was assigned to the Vatican Observatory Research Group here in Tucson and became its vice director in September of 2012. So let's please welcome these two wonderful panelists. The floor is yours. Well, thank you for having us. <clears throat> I thought perhaps I should start with uh, showing you a few maps because my CV is fairly convoluted and um, maybe from what uh, Dr. Cohen, uh, Cohen said, uh, you, you may have got lost a little bit. So um, my patron is uh, the prophet Jonah. Uh, when he heard God's voice sending him to Nineveh, he was reluctant and decided to hide as far away as possible, going basically in the opposite direction. And uh, when I was thinking about uh, what to do after high school, I was basically in a similar mindset. I had decided instead of heeding the call to priesthood, I decided to uh, become a physicist instead. So I went uh, and studied <clears throat> particle physics. Um, and uh, as Dr. Skern said, a part of that work uh, involved um, this thing, which is the Atlas uh, detector, or rather a certain skeleton thereof. Um, it happens to be in Geneva. Um, and then um, when Finally, I realized that I just couldn't take God's nagging anymore, and I, I just um, cracked and then finally joined the Jesuits. Um, <clears throat> I realized um, that, in fact, um, I'm joining a group that already has 35 of its members on the moon. Right? 35 lunar craters are named after my fellow Jesuits, so I'm, I'm quite uh, um, in a good place, I'd say. And... Um, and then um, 
I was in, in Krakow, see that nice little map there showing you, and, um, and in Paris. And uh, so this is one of the test beds that Dr. Scone mentioned. Um, and so this is a test bed, an optical test bed. If you've never seen one, it's, uh, it's quite cool, full of, uh, it's, it's basically magic, but you do it with, um, uh, with mirrors and no smoke, right? <clears throat> And this thing here is uh, the, uh, the proposed Darwin Observatory, which was uh, supposed to um, characterize spectroscopically planets that orbit other stars than our own sun. Uh, so it's a fairly um, difficult thing to do. That's why it, uh, it's a fairly difficult and complicated uh, design and proposal. And, uh, um, it didn't get the funding. but. One of these days, maybe before I die, somebody will have to do that experiment in some form or another. Um, I also spend a little time in Australia. It's basically reliving one's novitiate. Uh, it's again, uh, training to um, religious life. So, uh, things that have um, very little to do with astronomy directly, but uh, very much to do with being a Jesuit priest. And um, so the, the, the Vatican Observatory is where I work now. Um, it has two sites, uh, as you'll see later in this slideshow. One is <clears throat> outside of Rome in Castel Gandolfo, and the other one is at the University of Arizona in Tucson. Well. As I was saying, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, I'm Deb Harsma, and I also wanted to spend a few minutes introducing myself and my background. I grew up in the Great White North in Minnesota, uh, the land of uh, snow and ice in the winter, but also beautiful in the summer. And uh, I went to Bethel, uh, then college, now university, and it is a, uh, a Baptist school. So I'm a, a Protestant rather than a Catholic, and American rather than uh, European. Then I went uh, off to graduate school at MIT, where I studied astrophysics and got a PhD uh, studying galaxy clusters and gravitational lenses, and I'll say a few more words about that later on in the talk. I stayed on the East Coast for a postdoc at Haverford College, and then uh, went back to the Midwest, my home country, uh, to teach at Calvin College in Michigan, where I taught for 14 years. Uh, physics and astronomy did continue my research with students there. I've done a lot of my research with the Very Large Array Radio Telescope. So uh, this is not a telescope that you look through with your eye. This is a telescope that detects radio waves, which our eyes cannot see. So instead of radio waves hitting your car radio and the car radio turning them into sound, uh, instead we have radio waves coming from the universe, from galaxies. They hit these antennas and they're turned into images by combining the signals together. This is a really cool instrument. It's a day trip from here, if you ever want to go out and see this uh, in New Mexico. Each of these antennas is uh, 25 meters across, a quarter of a football field. And to stand next to those and watch them move, it's really impressive. So um, using this instrument was just a real privilege uh, to be able to study things out there in the universe that I that had never been seen before. We did surveys looking for gravitational lenses and to be able to step outside of the observatory and look at the night sky and see the beauty of the heavens. Things like this. So this is actually the um, Perseid meteor shower taken, it's a photo taken over Yosemite, a beautiful photo. And they've combined the uh, meteors together so you can see how they're all radiating from one point in space. Images like this fill everybody with a sense of wonder and awe looking at them. Um, being out in a meteor shower or seeing the northern lights or just seeing the Milky Way across the sky fills people with that sense of wonder and awe that there's something more to this than just what can be analyzed scientifically. In this photo, you can see uh, there's a lot of things going on here. You can see, of course, the rocks here on Earth. You can see uh, the meteors, which are debris from space, small rocks that are hitting our atmosphere. So that's from the solar system. And then most of these stars here are uh, near to the sun in our local neighborhood. And then you can look beyond that to see this band of the Milky Way, which is our galaxy as a whole. And as we go through the talk today, um, Dr. Gabor and I want to share with you um, 
a sense of perspective of the universe, where things are and how big they are, and some of our favorite images uh, that we love about the universe. So I will hand it back to you. Thank you. <clears throat> In fact, <clears throat> people sometimes say, well, you know, uh, with um, science, Science takes away some of the magic of the world. But I don't think that's quite true. In fact, the more you understand what is happening, what you're looking at, the more awe-inspiring it actually is. Um, so um, let's start with something which is relatively familiar, the sun. Well, do we really know it very well? In fact, it's too bright to be looked at. So um, let's have a look at it um, from a different perspective. In fact, it took um, humanity a very long time to figure out how to actually see the sun properly. Uh, it wasn't until the 20th century that we could take good pictures of the sun, precisely because it's so bright. <clears throat> and only in the last decades uh, did we learn how to take images like this. This is an image of the solar corona. By the way, what are you doing on the 21st of August this year? There will be a solar eclipse. It is really quite um, quite an event not to miss. It's, uh, if you haven't seen the total solar eclipse, you, it's, it's a must. <clears throat> and it's only visible from that one band across, uh, uh, running uh, across the United States from Oregon to um, South, South Carolina. <clears throat> In the last decades, we have also figured out how to see what is invisible to the human eyes. And with the sun, that's particularly spectacular, as you can see. The sun is, in fact, this gigantic ball of fire, if you like. It's plasma, to use a more <coughs> uh, accurate term. Um, the, uh, that's the size of the Earth for comparison. Um, so the size of this ball of fire is uh, 860,000 miles in diameter. It's just unimaginably huge. And it is right there. You can, you can study it from pretty close up. So uh, it's, it's a wonderful privilege to be orbiting such a, a majestic, uh, majestic body. <clears throat> the neighbors we have in the solar system, the planets, um, you all know. But if you look at the solar system from a, uh, from a distance, you will find that, in fact, um, there is the sun, obviously, is the brightest object. But the second brightest object you would see if you were an extraterrestrial looking at the solar system with a good telescope would be the Kuiper belt. Um, that is light scattered by very fine dust um, that is in this belt uh, where there are small bodies <clears throat> that uh, uh, sometimes collide and replenish the reservoirs of dust out there. There is a similar phenomenon closer in, the asteroid belt. Um, and then, of course, um, there are the planets as well. But, um, <clears throat> so this, uh, right. let, let's talk about uh, the other stars. <laughs> yes, so then we move out from the solar system to view the, uh, our stellar neighborhood. What are the stars near to the sun? So uh, there's the sun in the center, of course, uh, of this map. And uh, some of the bright stars you might know, Sirius is the brightest star in the sky. It's up in the uh, early evening right now. Uh, there's also Vega, Arcturus, some of the brightest stars in the night sky. But there's also a lot of the stars near the sun are quite faint, and you can't even see them without a telescope. So this would be the nearest uh, couple of dozen light years to the sun. A light year is the distance that light travels in a year. So our galaxy is made up of billions and hundreds of billions of stars, but not just stars. Our galaxy also has nebulae, like this. So this is the uh, M17 star cluster in nebula. It's about uh, 5,500 light years away from Earth. And the so you can see stars here, of course. There's a star cluster. But the beautiful colors you see are the gas and dust that uh, fills the space in between the stars. Um, there's a lot of hydrogen gases, other gases, and they uh, glow and scatter the light of the stars around. Then you also have these lovely swirls of dust. And it looks like smoke because it's very fine particles like smoke on Earth. But in interstellar space, they can be thick enough in regions like this that they block the light of things behind them. There's a very uh, thick dust cloud right there. 
Now, uh, if our Earth, our, sorry, Earth would be invisible on a picture like this to scale, but our solar system might be about the size of the end of that nub right there. Uh, and in little nubs like that, new stars are forming. Clouds of gas and dust are coalescing, they're orbiting around and uh, collapsing down to form new stars. And when those new stars turn on, they, uh, the energy shooting out from them pushes back the ga gas and dust. And you can kind of see here how the wind must be pushing back on this material. And we'll, you'll see a few images of uh, other nebulae later in the talk. OK, so then let's step out a step further in size to the Milky Way. So this is our galaxy. Uh, if only we could get a picture like this. But like our solar system, we're deep inside of it. Um, but we can map it out and do a map of what it would look like if we were able to stand outside of it. Here's the sun. Our sun is about roughly halfway from the center of the galaxy to the edge. And you, the uh, blue color here is um, accurate. A lot of the brightest stars in the galaxy are bluish because they're fairly new. And uh, you can also see these spiral arms. There's a beautiful spiral structure here that is due to uh, density waves, to gravitational perturbances that travel around the galaxy and cause this, this beautiful spiral pattern. You can see along the spiral pattern, not only are there more stars, but there are also these reddish blotches. And those are the nebulae that I was talking about. In fact, here's the sun. Here's the Orion Spur. And uh, the Orion Nebula is one of the brightest in the sky. And you'll see a picture of that later. So you can see our galaxy is about 30,000 light years in radius, so 60,000 light years across. Much bigger if you start to count things like dark matter, which we'll mention later. And of course, it's not the only galaxy in the universe. Our nearest uh, neighbor galaxy of similar size is Andromeda. It's about 2.5 million light years away, similar in size to the Milky Way. And uh, this, we can get a true photograph of it, a beautiful uh, blue color again on the outside. The spiral bands, here you can see how they're dark there. That's because those dust clouds are blocking uh, some of the light. You can see the yellowish bulge there indicating an older uh, population of stars, not so much these baby blue newborn stars, but older stars. And you can even see this uh, smaller galaxy here. This is a dwarf galaxy in orbit around the larger one. So galaxies come in different sizes and different shapes. And I will hand it back to Dr. Gabor for how they're arranged in the universe. In, in fact, I just wanted to add that the Andromeda galaxy is the source of the oldest light that is uh, likely to be recognized by your eye. Um, so if you ah. see the Andromeda galaxy, and you can, it's not that faint. So you just have to go into um, some dark spot, definitely not Phoenix. Um, so you have to go somewhere out into the country. And where you, when you are there, you might be able to see a fuzzy thing in the sky. And that is the Andromeda galaxy. And, but the light that hits your retina, in fact, has traveled for two and a half million years before it, it did it, before it hit you. So it's, it's quite, a, uh, quite an achievement that you can see that with the naked eye. Um, the galaxies, of course, um, well, we've already mentioned a couple. In fact, <clears throat> we've, Dr. Hosmer said that there were uh, several different sizes. So the Milky Way galaxy has the satellite galaxies around it too, just like uh, the Andromeda galaxy does. And uh, in fact, in this local galactic group, our galactic group, um, there are two major galaxies, our own, the Milky Way, and the Andromeda galaxy. <clears throat> the rest of them tend to be smaller. Um, but in this diagram, um, you'll see these dots of light. They are, in fact, just representations of where galaxies are. So this is the Virgo supercluster of galaxies. It's uh, <clears throat> um, a conglomeration of different groups of galaxies. So our local group is, is here somewhere. And uh, as you can see, there are groups that are much bigger. There are <clears throat> superclusters, um, like the Virgo supercluster, uh, sorry, uh, the, the, the clusters like the Virgo cluster. And this whole thing um, is called a supercluster. You see that the material is in fact in uh, these filament-like structures. It's, it's not uniformly spread out. And the one thing you uh, may have noticed already without us talking about it is that 
most of space is empty. There doesn't seem to be anything there. There are these huge voids between galaxies. But even between the individual stars of a galaxy, the distances are much, much larger than the sizes of the stars. <clears throat> so um, there are many superclusters like the Virgo supercluster. And uh, again, this diagram shows you uh, um, an idea of where things are in our local neighborhood, so to speak. By the way, these wonderful diagrams were made by a gentleman who I believe is a student at the ASU. Um, at least that's what I found out uh, just uh, recently. Um, so um, the overall large-scale structure of the universe um, is a little similar to um, the foam in your bubble bath. There is a lot of <laughs> bubbles, so to speak, where the material itself just forms these um, thin shells <clears throat> around the empty space. Um, what we'll see uh, in the coming three and a half minutes is a wonderful um, video showing um, some of the stuff we've already seen, but uh, we'll be taking advantage of the great projection system in this room to show you things. Why I'm talking now is um, for showing it to you is because at the very beginning, you need to see the Orion uh, constellation. So try and see that shape. And Sirius, uh, the brightest star in our sky, will whiz off very quickly because <coughs> we'll be moving towards the Great Orion Nebula. And as a result, the shape of the constellation will be distorted. The constellation is simply a projection of a shape that doesn't exist uh, in another, uh, if, if you approach it from a different angle, and as you uh, go in, uh, the positions of stars in 3D will make things go away. So we can show you this uh, wonderful video thanks to um, Brent Tully of the University of Hawaii, who very kindly provided the, uh, a high-definition version of it. So there you have Orion, that was Betelgeuse just leaving the screen now, and now we are moving <coughs> very quickly uh, to the Orion Nebula, a star-forming region. Quite impressive. Now, another one. This one is known uh, as the Horsehead Nebula because of that horsehead feature, which is, in fact, uh, dark, uh, dark, dark, uh, and you can see the band of the Milky Way behind. Yes, and th this, is, this is the Rosette Nebula with some uh, um, uh, newly born stars. And we are now approaching a, a completely different thing, which sort of looks the same, but it isn't. It's the Crab Nebula. It's a stellar remnant after a supernova explosion. So the core of the star collapsed, forming uh, a neutron star, which pulses, and you can see that, uh, in the video, represented uh, in the visible. In fact, it pulses in the radio, uh, and the material around it is uh, simply the stellar envelope that got blown out and is still moving away. And now we are leaving the plane of our galaxy. There go the Magellanic Clouds, two of the satellite galaxies of our own. And now we'll be slowly moving two and a half million light years to the Andromeda galaxy with one of its companion galaxies, the Pinwheel Galaxy, M33, with a huge star-forming uh, nebula, this one. If uh, it were the same distance as the Orion Nebula is to the Earth, uh, it would take up half of the sky. Now, all the light things we see in these images are, in fact, galaxies. The 101, M101 galaxy, the M51 galaxy, they are all about the size of our own Milky Way, maybe a little larger. And now <clears throat> we are going to approach the um, Virgo cluster, which contains about a thousand galaxies, but the 
before we get there, we are in fact passing through the Ursa Major cluster with about 100 elliptical galaxies, and now we are getting closer and closer to the Virgo cluster itself, which is the main um, concentration of uh, visible material um, for um, 100 million light years around. And this is the largest elliptical galaxy in the Virgo cluster. It is uh, the M87. Uh, okay. Goes back to me. Uh, wasn't that cool? <laughs> it's so neat with the uh, modern technology to be able to fly through space and see how these things are related to each other, even to see the galaxies spinning. Um, to see their relative locations. Did you see in the galaxy cluster, the galaxies were actually in motion? They're moving around each other? Now, uh, just before the video, uh, Dr. Gabor showed the, um, the, the known universe, all the galaxies in the known universe. Now, it's very hard to take a picture of the whole universe, but I want to show you something that gives you a little taste of it. So this is a, a project that was done with the Hubble Space Telescope. And, uh, here you have the moon to scale. Um, but just to show you how big a region we're looking at, it's about this big. And as you can see, um, this little spot on the sky, it doesn't have any bright stars in it. It doesn't have any bright galaxies in it. The researchers doing this picked a small spot that looked pretty much empty. And you might think that the black background in all of this is just empty space, but it is not. If you take uh, the Hubble Space Telescope can take many, many images over days and weeks and add them all together. You can get the most sensitive image ever made, showing you what's really in the background there. So if you hold your finger up, uh, if you hold your thumb up at arm's length, that more than covers the moon. If you hold your pinky up, that gets to be closer to the size of this little field. Every little postage stamp of the sky like that, if you have a sensitive enough telescope, looks like this. It's not empty. It's full of thousands of galaxies. And of course, a few stars. Uh, there's a star. There's a star. But again, almost every uh, piece of light on here is from an entire galaxy of hundreds of billions of stars. And this is the wallpaper of the universe. So every spot in the sky has this in the deep background. You can see the variety of galaxies here. You can see some are red and elliptical. You can see uh, some are blue and funny shapes. Some of those are the most um, distant galaxies from us, and we're seeing them at the very early stages where they're forming. You can see pretty spiral galaxies. This one um, is quite a bit like the Milky Way. You can almost see, yep, there, there's, you are here. You know, it kind of feels like there's <laughs> a little sign there. When you look at this, you can you get a sense of where humanity is in the universe. We are part of something vast beyond ourselves. So that's our tour of the universe. I want to transition now just to tell you a little bit more about my own research and background, and uh, then we'll trade back. So uh, my own research, as I mentioned, is in these galaxy clusters. So you can see some more of these. Uh, I, the images I'm going to show you are of my favorite galaxy clusters, one of the really photogenic ones. And the images come from the Hubble Space Telescope in orbit around the Earth and the Chandra X-ray Observatory farther away from Earth. Um, Hubble Space Telescope takes images with visible light. The Chandra X-ray Observatory detects X-rays from space. So instead of the X-rays going from the machine in the dentist's office through your teeth to some film, We've got x-rays going from very distant objects traveling all the way to, to uh, this observatory where they are detected. So first looking at the visible light image, here is a picture of galaxy cluster Abel 1689. Now this has a lot of similarities to the Virgo cluster, thousands of galaxies, but this is actually richer. There's um, even more galaxies in this uh, cluster than in the Virgo cluster. And the, they're uh, yellowish here in this image. And so all of these yellowish galaxies, uh, they're about the same color because they're about the same redshift or distance away from us. And most of the light you are seeing here is from the stars in those galaxies. But there is more here than meets the eye. If you look at this in X-ray light, you can look at this exact same field in X-ray light, and it looks like this. Really? That really, that's, in, that's not out of focus. 
In X-ray light, what you see is something very diffuse, a huge ball of very hot gas, hundreds of millions of degrees, so hot that it is emitting X-rays. And it is not tied to the particular galaxies. There's X-ray light from a few galaxies here, but most of it is this diffuse gas filling the space between the galaxies. So just to flip back and forth again, we're looking at the exact same spot in the sky. And here they are combined together. There is five to ten times more mass in that gas cloud than there is in the stars of these galaxies. So if the X-ray gas had been discovered first, we, would, we wouldn't call these galaxy clusters, we'd call them big gas balls or something. And, uh, and then, oh look, there's some galaxies embedded in it, but really a lot more of the mass is in that very hot plasma gas. But that's not where most of the mass is. There's yet more going on in this that we can't uh, see at all in any kind of light, but we do see its effect, and that is dark matter. So this image, I've zoomed in a little bit to highlight um, these blue arcs here. So you can see these arcs going around the, uh, this galaxy cluster. And that is due to an effect called gravitational lensing. This is due to the curvature of space. This galaxy cluster is so massive that it is distorting space so that things that are behind this, when their light passes through it, it's like passing through a lens and the light gets warped and distorted so that we see it not as it really is, but stretched out. So this is a small blue galaxy located somewhere behind here, but we're seeing it as an arc here, and maybe it's that one. It's showing up in a couple different places on this image. That curvature of space, it's due to the mass of the cluster, the mass of the stars, the mass of the X-ray gas. But what this arcing is showing us is there's even more mass than that. There's about 10 times the amount of mass of all that stuff but in dark matter. So dark matter contains, there's more mass in dark matter than there is in ordinary matter in the universe. It's not true just for this cluster. So we now know that the universe, uh, here's the, the mass energy budget of the whole universe. Dark matter here makes up about 26% of the universe, um, but atoms make up about 5%. Atoms, that's everything you know from the periodic table. That's everything in this room. That's everything in our bodies, carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, hydrogen. Those are the atoms. But the dark matter is probably some exotic elementary particle. We're still working out what that is, and work at accelerators like CERN will help us uh, figure that out. And then there is dark energy. And we know even less about dark energy. We, uh, we know for sure that it is the thing that's, that's the label we've given to the thing that's causing the expansion of the universe to speed up over time, to accelerate in the expansion. And we don't know a lot else about what that is. I'm hoping in my lifetime that we'll figure out what dark matter is. Maybe we'll figure out what dark energy is. You should uh, watch the news on that. So when I ponder this, when there's 95% there's of the universe that astronomers don't really understand what the stuff is, there's so much more to discover in the universe. And that's one of the things I love about being a scientist. Um, I love that sense of discovery. All scientists love that. And uh, science does not take the one, away the wonder. And then for me, as a Christian, there's an extra level to that sense of wonder. Not only do I have a sense of wonder and awe when I look at these things, when I hear about the amount of dark matter and dark energy in the universe, for me it goes beyond that because as a Christian, I can praise the Creator who made all of this. Um, it sets that, the scientific knowledge that I have into this larger picture in which uh, there is a person, a Creator behind the universe who um, has created all of this with intention and who loves me and uh, who loves all of humanity. And that larger context is uh, one of the things that I treasure about my faith and helps make sense of everything around me. So I will hand it back to you to give your perspective. Thank you very much. So <clears throat> I, I agree absolutely that, uh, uh, in, in fact, far from uh, making us conceited and arrogant, in, uh, what science does is it shows us how deep our ignorance actually is. Yeah. Um, and it simply helps us ask the right questions. I think that's the main thing science does for us. It allows us to see things with a little more clarity, perhaps, but uh, 
That also means seeing uh, all the stuff we don't know yet um, and seeing all these wonderful horizons of uh, new uh, beckoning uh, phenomena to, to, dis to discover and to explore. Uh, the, uh, uh, oh, I didn't do this part. <laughs> you I should I had more part. to say, I so, forgot. Yes. <laughs> yes, okay, well, I wanted to, <laughs> to say that um, uh, Dr. Gabor and I are not the only scientists who are, who are Christians who see uh, God as the creator, the God of the Bible as the creator. And I wanted to show you just a few others. Ian Hutchinson is a professor of nuclear physics at MIT. Um, Francis Sue is at Harvey Mudd. He's president of the Mathematical Association of America. Jennifer Wiseman uh, is a uh, leading astronomer. Um, Praveen Sathapathy does genetics. And uh, Audrey uh, Bowden is in electrical engineering. Jeff Harden is chair of the uh, Department of Zoology and does embryology at the University of Wisconsin. And these are all um, sci leading scientists who believe. So there are some people who say, oh, well, if you are a religious person, somehow your science is compromised. And it is not the case for these people here and for, some, for the people that uh, Dr. Gabor will show you as well. And I wanted to close with a little word about um, the organization that I'm a part of. Francis Collins is, the, is another one of these leading scientists of faith. He's uh, directed the Human Genome Project, and he now directs the National Institutes of Health. And he wrote the book, The Language of God, in which he tells his story of his, um, how he grew in his scientific career and also how he um, decided as an adult that, yes, he, was going, he believed that God not only existed, but uh, was, he became a Christian. He believed that God is his own savior as well. Um, when that book came out, there was a lot of reaction to it. There were uh, scientists who read that book and said, OK, Francis Collins, we know you're a great scientist, but why are you talking about this religious stuff? But then there were uh, conservative Christians on the other side who said, oh, it's so great to hear that you became a Christian. We're thrilled to hear that. Why are you talking about evolution? And there's a lot of concern about that from that side. And so uh, Francis Collins uh, founded the organization BioLogos. The name comes from the Greek, bio for life, and logos for the word. Life through the word, where the word is Christ. And uh, our organization has gone on to have, we have a very rich website with um, uh, hundreds and hundreds of articles um, by uh, a couple hundred different uh, leading scientists as well as leading theologians, pastors, lay people, all talking about how do we bring the best of modern science together with um, the, the core of the Christian faith. So uh, that's a little bit about that. We'll say more in the discussion time, but I will now hand it off to you. Oh, thank you. So um, my institution, the Vatican Observatory, <clears throat> um, will be presented, not by me, but by a nice little five-minute video, um, which is very dynamic and uh, very, very pretty, but um, it doesn't contain all information that I wanted to convey. So let me first tell you that <clears throat> the Vatican Observatory um, uh, has been around for quite a long time. In one way or another, uh, the, the popes had astronomers working for them since uh, the 1570s. That's quite a long time. Uh, we currently have two sites, um, the site in Castel Gandolfo and the site in Tucson. Uh, the reason for that is uh, uh, light pollution, which has uh, basically dr driven astronomers away from, uh, you know, from most of Europe these days, not just Italy. But southern Arizona has retained a little bit of its dark skies, and we are hoping that it will continue that way. Um, the uh, observatory has been entrusted by the popes to the Society of Jesus, the religious order known as the Jesuits. So um, <clears throat> in principle, um, all our staff astronomers are Jesuits, but there are always exceptions to that rule. So this gentleman is a diocesan priest who is not a Jesuit. And um, <clears throat> not all of the members are Jesuit priests. Some of them are Jesuit lay brothers. Um, and finally, um, I just wanted to say that, as you can see, every one of us basically has a slightly different field of interest in astronomy uh, or planetary science. So, um, in fact, <clears throat> what happens is that each one of us collaborates with people from other institutions um, all around the world, essentially. <clears throat> so we are not uh, um, an enclosed little ghetto 
but in, we, we, the, the Vatican Observatory is an institutional um, foundation that uh, we, we use to, to do our research, but uh, we do the research with people from outside. <clears throat> um, the main infrastructure that we have um, for observations, but not all of us do astronomical observations, um, is this telescope, which is on Mount Graham. Um, and um, it's, uh, it's a telescope that has been around for 23 years now. Uh, so it needs upgrades. And that's basically uh, my job now. And uh, um, I hope that in the coming couple of years, we'll finish the upgrades. We are sort of halfway there now. Um, and my great um, aspiration is that we would be able to use this telescope um, for one of the projects that I'm interested in particular, and it has to do with weighing exoplanets, that is to say, determining the masses of planets orbiting other stars than our own sun using <clears throat> this fiber link, taking light from our telescope to this instrument, <clears throat> which is um, in another facility on the same mountaintop and uh, hopefully we'll be able to, uh, to do some interesting, interesting work that will help us find planets that resemble our own, uh, own Earth, uh, planetary systems that perhaps are, um, in their diversity, are going to tell us something about how planetary systems form in general. And, um, um, well, um, this, this project, uh, we are, we are currently testing the feasibility of the connection and uh, um, taking the first spectra this semester um, in the Rayleigh velocities. So uh, I'm quite excited about that. So now over to the video. Both science and religion are conversations about the universe. They're ways of learning how we interact with this universe. It's not simply a question of is there a God, but there is a God, now what do we do? It's not just a question of there are a bunch of stars, but rather why are there stars? How do they work? How does that tell us how things work here on Earth? The interaction that I see in my own life is that religion gives me the reason to do the science. Back in the papacy before Francis was Benedict, and one of his lines in a final elocution to the fathers of the general congregation was, go to the frontiers. Well, there isn't much more frontier than 3.7 billion years away. The first uh, official interest of the Church for astronomy started in 1582 with the reform of the calendar. Then in 1891, Pope Leo XIII wanted to have an observatory to show that the Church is not against science, but uh, the Church promotes good science. They start up by having telescopes on the Tower of the Winds, and then on the walls surrounding the Vatican, as the city lights grow, and as the Italian government gives them back the territory out in Castel Gandolfo. In the 30s, they build new telescopes on the roof of the Papal Palace in Castel Gandolfo, best telescopes of their era in the 1930s. By the 1980s, light pollution makes those telescopes unusable, so we build a new telescope in the dark skies of Arizona. I'm Father Jean-Baptiste Kikwaya Eluo. I'm working in three projects. The first one is NEOS, Near Earth Object. So what I'm doing with NEOS is just observe them using our modern telescope VAT. The second project is METEOS. I worked on very faint METEOS, what we call shooting stars. And the third project is set fireball network. They will have four cameras here around Tucson so that actually we can monitor any fireball getting into the Earth atmosphere in the region. This telescope, the Vatican Advanced Technology Telescope, it was the first 
of the new technology telescopes that has been considered pretty much the norm now in, in developing telescopes. With the advance of computer technology, we have the capability of bringing that advanced technology directly into our telescope. So it's an expandable, it's almost like it's a living machine, so it can grow as uh, technology grows. It is still very important to maintain scientific research at the Vatican, simply because there is still a lot of confusion about this relationship between science and faith. We are not out here trying to prove the existence of God by looking through a telescope. That's not what we're doing. But we can say that if we want to obtain any reasonable results looking through that telescope, we need to do it embracing a certain work ethics that is in fact, the same work ethics that the Bible itself tells us through commandments and through the Gospels to embrace. Human beings look at the stars and wonder. They want to know, what is that? What is that about? How do I fit in? They hear about the moon landing and they want to know, what was that like? Very well. If we're part of the human race, we're part of the race that went to the moon. We're part of the species that looked at the stars and wondered, what the heck are those things? Looking at the sky reminds you that there's more to the universe than what's for lunch. What's more, if you believe in a universe that God so loved that he sent his son, then not only are you gonna to wanna to study the universe because it's kinda of cool, it's an act of worship. It's an act of getting closer to the Creator and getting closer to a universe, as St. Athanasius said 1,500 years ago, was cleansed and quickened by the Incarnation. Then, doing science is an act of worship. So the next part of our dialogue today will involve um, a discussion motivated by some questions. And uh, there it is. OK, good. Um, we are uh, pursuing this, this uh, dialogue, this interaction, using Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. And if you have questions that you would like to have posed to be entered into the discussion, you can send them by text message to that particular phone number, and then I get them on my magic box here, and uh, I can enter them into the discussion that we'll have as we go forward. So please participate if you would like to. And I'm going to start this discussion, if I can get the magic box to work, um, with the first question uh, for you both. Uh, many people today see science and religion as independent and unrelated things or in direct conflict with each other. How do you each see the relationship between science and religion? Okay, I'll start. <laughs> uh, so uh, there's a metaphor that has been developed in Christian theology going back to Augustine, I think, um, where we have the Bible as... God's book of scripture, his revelation to us in words, and then to see the natural world as a second book of revelation. So we have these two books, and in both of those, God is revealing himself to us, and they inform each other. So we understand from scripture who Jesus Christ is and our need for salvation, and that God is the creator. But then we look at the natural world and we see how God went about doing it and when God did it. And we see these wonderful illustrations of the glory and power of God that when you're outside and you look at the night sky, you have this, this sense of um, things that are beyond yourself. And you don't always get that from the written page. And so the natural world brings that about. Okay. Uh, there's this <clears throat> doctrine of the two books is uh, quite um, dear to me too. And uh, I think it uh, is, is a very good one. <clears throat> good way of thinking of uh, the relationship between um, um, reason and faith, let's say. Um, 
I believe um, a Catholic interpretation of uh, one verse in uh, Romans, I think it's chapter 1, verse 20, um, is that uh, <clears throat> essentially <clears throat> that is already the beginning of this doctrine of the two books. So what does St. Paul say there? He says that um, the natural reason can uh, uh, show us, in fact, the glory of God. Because looking at creation, we see how munificent, um, how generous, how giving uh, God is. Um, so, in, in fact, the, uh, the classic, I think, treatise on the two books dates back to the 1440s, so 15th century, it's Renaissance, late Middle Ages, if you like theology, and uh, uh, the, the, the gentleman who wrote the book was called Raymond Sabundus, and um, he uh, maintains that the, this first book, the book of creatures, as he calls it, um, tells us uh, quite a lot, in fact, and in fact it tells us enough um, about God. The only problem is that um, over the history of, um, uh, of uh, humanity, people somehow lost their capacity to see um, the grandeur of God in creation. And this um, obscured vision then lead, led to, to people um, requiring a second book, the book of Scripture, where God tells us um, how he um, interacted with uh, individuals and groups and the chosen people of the Old Testament, and, of course, um, about the incarnation of the Logos uh, and uh, uh, the uh, redemption uh, through the uh, mysteries of um, uh, the death and resurrection of Christ. All that is in the second book. But in fact, the core message is already visible in the book of creatures. If you know how to somehow read that message. And this is, this is the key thing. Um, we are, um, when it comes to understanding um, the book of creatures, we are quite often prone to um, misunderstand, and perhaps uh, looking in the wrong direction, perhaps not reading uh, quite with our hearts and uh, just focusing on the brain. That's, that's very important, of course, because that's uh, the key to uh, seeing the letters in the book. But to understand what the book is about, you need to look with the heart. Uh, the advantage of the book of creatures is that it is accessible to anybody. Mm -hmm. The book of scripture, you can only understand as the Word of God, if you accept it in faith as the Word of God. So, in mm. fact, it's not quite um, um, self-sufficient uh, self uh, self either. And essentially, um, there is a certain complementarity between these two approaches. And I think it's, uh, it's a very good metaphor. I, 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 I use it quite a lot. And I think it's, uh, it can be quite productive even, even for our um, reflection today on various matters. Um, but what was the question again? <laughs> <laughs> well, the, the question mentioned something about conflict as well. Ah, yeah. conflict. Yes. Oh, yeah. yes, yes, so, yes. So, you know, I guess what we're arguing is that they're not, we're arguing against them being like separate and unrelated, that there's this beautiful interplay between them. Hmm. Um, so, but you hear a lot about conflicts in our world today where, um, People say, well, the Bible says this, but science says that. Obviously, they disagree. But I think it comes down to our human understanding of it, which you were mm. talking about, how we can misunderstand the natural world. We can get it wrong, um, both in its theological, what it's saying, and in its scientifically, what it's saying. But we can also misinterpret Scripture if we're not looking at it aright, or that you know, Christians disagree about how to read certain passages of Scripture. So this two-books metaphor reminds us that... Um, Nature and scripture themselves are not in conflict, but our human understanding of one or both of them can be in error, and then we run into all sorts of conflicts. Yeah, we, we have quite an astounding capacity to um, miss the obvious and misunderstand each other very easily. Um, 
you know, uh, looking at these astronomical pictures, I'm not entirely sure whether um, uh, some of you uh, in this room experienced it, but um, in audiences similar to this, I've uh, encountered this type of reaction before. People feel threatened. They feel um, hmm. that they are completely insignificant, uh, that this universe is just too big, um, and uh, that it is completely inconceivable that anybody, um, not even the, the greatest and the most loving of gods, could possibly take any interest in the insignificant little me, because the universe is just so huge. And this reaction is, is quite understandable, but what faith tells us is that exactly this is the point. The universe is so huge, and in spite of that, um, there's somebody who cares for every one of us. Mm -hmm. And that's quite astounding, especially when you see the, the, the real scale of the thing. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm just saying um, our capacity to miss the obvious and, uh, and get just the wrong <laughs> message out of something <laughs> mm -hmm. is quite, uh, uh, quite astounding. Um, but the conflict, well, uh, historically speaking, of course, <clears throat> the perception that there is a conflict is fairly new. Uh, it only started, I would say, in the late 19th century, mm -hmm. um, maybe the second half of the 19th century. Um, there were already um, types of, um, of tensions in the, ninth, in, in the 18th century with um, the Enlightenment, but that was different. That was a, the, the perception that throughout history, Christianity was a force that was trying to prevent scientific progress. I mean, this, this paradigm of reading history in this particular light, this is something that really can be dated quite nicely, and it's the second half of the 19th century when it started. So it's, in fact, quite new. Um, our institution started in the 16th century um, when this was really uh, not there. Um, the, uh, it is true that, you know, that there was... Um, Galileo and, and all that, <clears throat> but the reasons behind what happened there were very different. It was not a question of Christianity trying to do something and, uh, versus science, uh, scientific progress and the scientists trying to do something else. That, that's anachronistic. That's really the 19th century optic that is projecting um, 19th century attitudes on what happened. Uh, in the 17th century with, uh, let's say, Galileo. It's, it's very complex because to do history properly, you, you really need professional historians to decipher all the stuff that happened. And um, uh, professional historians of uh, the last uh, generation or two have really been very good uh, in trying to do that, just that, and trying to see also how their predecessors um, actually deceived the public by creating this perception mm -hmm. of, uh, of a conflict. Okay. So the next uh, question we have is, do your religious beliefs lead you to different scientific conclusions than other scientists? Well, demonstrably not. Uh, <laughs> so the science we've been showing you is the same science you'll hear anywhere in this building and on this campus. Um, our organizations, the Vatican Observatory and BioLogos, are committed to the, the same science. I think what throws people off, though, is like, shouldn't it make a difference? Like, people somehow think it ought to, or if it doesn't make a difference, then how is? I, I will sometimes get asked if your science looks just the same as anybody else's science who isn't a Christian, then why would you believe in God? And behind that question is an assumption that there is some scientific evidence for God that I should be looking at. Mm -hmm. And that's not why I believe in God. I believed in God long before I knew about um, various things about uh, modern cosmology. Mm -hmm. And my discovery of them only uh, strengthened my understanding of God. I believe in God because of the testimony of Scripture, because I have uh, the testimony of the church, of friends and family I know who believe in God, of um, seeing answers to prayer myself, and honestly, of just sheer falling in love with a creator who cr creates so much vast beauty 
and still love me, it could still humble himself enough to come incarnate as the person of Jesus Christ on this earth and die for us. That's a God I want to love. That, that was going to be uh, an embellishment of that question I was going to okay. ask, was whether yeah. your science actually makes a difference in terms of shaping your faith or your perception of your faith. Yeah. And it sounds like in some level maybe it does because of just the, the enormity of what you have become familiar with through science, but your faith yeah. is rooted in much deeper roots than yes. that. Yes, yeah, because the, the faith brings it all together. Yes. The spiritual experience, the human relationships, and the natural world, it all comes together, but yeah, yeah. Okay. You wish to contribute to that, mm. Father? Well, uh, I think that uh, this, is, this is really what I wanted to say. Um, maybe the, the science is different, of course. Um, but one thing which perhaps might be useful to, to mention is, is um, that science, in fact, is a, is a very difficult, tiring, tiresome sometimes um, <laughs> endeavor. And uh, as such, it represents, in fact, a certain quest. Um, and it is, in a way, a form of asceticism. Mm. Uh, it's an interesting point that, uh, uh, you know... What's it said? So basically it's, it's, it's that the whole point of your endeavor is to achieve something. Now, if you don't achieve it, you have to deal with failure, for instance. Now, <clears throat> you need certain discipline to do science. You need certain maturity to deal with that potential failure. Mm -hmm. So it is a way how you can grow as a human person. Mm -hmm. And I think this, this aspect of it is, um, is fairly clear if you look at um, scientists who are really perceptive and uh, who, who know what they are doing and, and who have somehow been confronted with um, their own frailty and their own shortcomings. And it, so, so in other words, I'm saying that you know, quite often um, in the community, um, scientific community, you can, you can find people who have matured as human beings because of their science. It is nice mm -hmm. um, to be in that group of people. I mm -hmm. really appreciate um, my fellow scientists, whether they would consider themselves believers or not. Um, there is quite a lot to be said for this um, innate ability of the book of creatures mm -hmm. to transform one uh, attitude and um, uh, form the um, existential choices that we make. Um, it is much more important to a scientist to um, pursue the research than, let's say, figuring out um, uh, how they could make more money. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I would mention one example, if I may. Um, in 2009, uh, that was the International Year of Astronomy, as both of you know very well, mm -hmm. um, I was fortunate enough to be uh, at the UNESCO headquarters at the inauguration ceremony. There was about 630 people in the room representing 130 countries. And it just so happened that the person sitting right in front of me was somebody I knew quite well, Professor André Braik, who was um, one of those very outspoken atheists. Uh, in every talk he would somehow managed to say something against Christianity. So the first thing that happened in that auditorium was an introductory talk given by Catherine Cezarski, then uh, the president of the International Astronomical Union. And what she said was this, more or less. Okay, so we are celebrating 400 years since the first telescopic observations made by Galileo, 400 years since Kepler's laws. This is all wonderful, but the real metric by which we should measure the success or failure of this international year of astronomy is if we manage to get every single human being on this planet to look up, see the wonder of the universe, and think about their place in it. See how petty our earthly squabbles are and how magnificent the universe is. And this was a wonderful thing to say. And, you know, everybody in the room was ecstatic about it. 
including our Hebrae. <laughs> but in fact, what Catherine Cezescu was proposing was a sort of a spiritual um, program for uh, you know, a spiritual re renewal of, of the whole humanity. Uh, but he wouldn't have recognized it as such. He wouldn't have used those words. Um, but that was exactly what, uh, what um, everybody in that room was, was so enthusiastic about. And I think we've um, failed miserably, but we tried at least mm -hmm. in international <laughs> astronomy to, uh, to convey this sense of wonder. Um, Does the vastness of the universe ever cause a scientist to conclude that human life and existence is so tiny that it might be judged as being insignificant. And I think that feeds on exactly what you were just talking about. I think most scientists don't see it that way at all. It's quite a number in, uh, of people who are, sh maybe it's just a shock factor, and people who are first confronted with the vastness of the universe can have that reaction. But uh, on the whole. Well, but there's some popularizers of science who really play that up. So yes, that's Car true Carl too. Sagan yes. was a great scientist, but he would put that spin on it. He, uh, there's some quote of him saying, um, humans are just on this little humdrum planet lost in an insignificant corner of the universe, forgotten. It, it's, it's all of this spin on it as if we are, in, the word insignificance is really in there. Um, so I, for me, that's a place where I see my faith making a difference. Um, scripture actually addresses this directly. Um, for those of you who know the Bible, Psalm 103 um, says, as high as the heavens are above the earth, and then it doesn't say, go on to say, so great is God and so small are you. No, it says, as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is God's love. And as far as the east is from the west, the whole extent of the universe, so far as he removed our sins from us, that's how great God's forgiveness is. So. Um, those verses there were referring to the entire cosmos, and we know that's bigger than they knew back then in those ancient days, but mm -hmm. um, I think that's just expanded our understanding of God's love and forgiveness. Wonderful. What was it like to study science while many of your fellow colleagues and students were in fact non-believers, and did the experience strengthen your faith as a result? Well, I've already mentioned that, uh, you know, in, in my experience, uh, it was really a very interesting environment that uh, I found really quite open to um, existential questions, open to spiritual uh, and uh, religious ideas. And um, on the whole, you know, it was quite a positive experience. I'd say that, um, you know, it, it's quite funny, but... Um, um, two of my colleagues who we started our studies in Prague with um, in 1988 um, are, are Catholic priests too. Um, so, um, you know, it's, it's not entirely by coincidence, I think, that uh, people who, who want to understand um, something deeply enough and are committed enough to that understanding um, may make a commitment to, <laughs> let's say, the religious life. Mm -hmm. yeah, could be. Um, in my career, most of the scientists I've worked with in graduate school and later have been um, not hostile, mm -hmm. um, open, curious, um, unfamiliar with religious faith, but curious mm -hmm. about it. Um, there's been one or two who are, who are hostile or like, oh, I don't know if I can see you as a genuine scientist mm -hmm. now that I know you are a believer. But that was quite rare, actually. I, I, I think some of the loudest voices, the popularizers of science, the Richard, Richard Dawkins and Jerry Coyne and some of those, really play up that atheist angle. But I don't think that reflects the majority of scientists. On the back table there, I have a, a sample book by Elaine Eklund, who's done a lot of good sociological research on the mm -hmm. views of scientists about religion that mm -hmm. gets into some of the statistics of where scientists are really at. Hmm. And, and many of them are open to spirituality. And I think the diehard atheists among scientists is a minority. Okay. So, yeah. okay. You talked about the light from Andromeda taking millions of years to reach Earth. How do you reconcile time periods measured in millions of years with the seven days that Genesis says God used to create the universe? And do you hold scripture as the ultimate source and norm of truth? 
So this is a question we get a lot at BioLogos. Sure. And, and maybe less so in, in the Catholic world, I don't know. But um, so a lot of American evangelicals do read the, the scriptures as requiring the six days of creation. That's actually the background that I grew up in. My home church and my family uh, had that view. So I'm, I'm quite familiar with this question. What, and and for, for all Christians, we see the Bible as God's inspired word, so we want to take it seriously. So then how do you understand a passage like that? And um, what helped me was to understand more of the ancient context of this text. You cannot read the Bible as if it is a modern scientific textbook or even a modern um, historic, historical textbook. There's certainly history in it. There's things in it that refer to the natural world. But understanding that original context is really essential. And in the ancient world, uh, a, pat, a metaphor of six days or seven days was a very common um, thing that was used in the genre of that time. Um, you see other things in the text that point it, to it being something different than what we're familiar with. Um, so in Genesis 1, there's the six days. And on the second day, it says God created a firmament uh, a dome to separate the water above from the water below. And I never knew in the, what in the world that was referring to. But in ancient times, they really did believe there was a solid dome holding up an ocean above the sky and that the earth was flat. And this was part of the um, origin stories that the different ancient cultures in the Near East would tell each other. So yeah. I see the passage as God using some of those... Uh, incidental beliefs that they had about the physical world in order to focus their attention on the spiritual message of there being one God as the creator and not a whole pantheon of gods, um, mm. to see the, the important role of humanity um, as something created very good as the culmination of creation rather than the other stories had a much more demeaning role for humanity. So those themes, I think, are what are most essential from that passage. Interesting. Yeah. yeah thank you for that because... Uh, as you said, uh, quite rightly, in the, in the Catholic world, this type of a question is much rarer. Um, and for a reason. The reason is that <clears throat> we have gone through uh, several crises um, over centuries. Um, the last one probably had to do with Galileo himself. Um, and it ties in very nicely with the second part of your question. Mm -hmm. What is the ultimate arbiter of truth? Um, oh, yeah. Yeah. So, in, in, in fact, Scripture, um, obviously, in the Catholic tradition, is not uh, self-explanatory. Scripture is inspired by the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit inspires the Church just as it inspires the Bible. So, in fact, you can't interpret the Bible without communion with the Church, uh, the body animated by the Holy Spirit. Um, once you see that perspective, you realize that, okay, so there is this um, community that is there to help you, perhaps guide you in some ways, in your understanding of the text. The text isn't just something you can go to a bookstore and then buy and read. That's not how it works at all. Mm. You need to be animated by the Holy Spirit, which is something that is only possible in the community of, of believers. And only then can you read what is really meant by the biblical passages. So this is, in a nutshell, the Catholic view of um, uh, what the Bible can and cannot do. Um, it was Cardinal Baronius in, uh, I think, the 16th century uh, who said that uh, <clears throat> um, the, uh, the Bible um, tells us how to go to heaven and not how heavens go. Um, it's a very nice way of, uh, of saying that you know this is this is not a textbook, um, but it is also true that you know over well, centuries people have had this tendency to uh, perhaps try and uh, find as much po as possible um, of the literal meaning of the Bible and the biblical narrative um, in the history of the world, in natural history as well, and um, th this. This tendency has been around for a while, and it comes and goes. Um, and uh, it is not completely unnatural to, to uh, want to do that, but it's, um, I think, um, uh, not entirely um, appropriate. Um, it, the, you know, uh, Galileo himself was uh, was really uh, a, a great guy. He he was uh, mm -hmm. he was uh, really in in in. What kind in, of arrogant? 
he was he, he was probably a little bit uh, on the arrogant side. He was a little bit full of himself, but mm-hmm. um, but, but but he was he had a genuine faith. I think he, I mean, he, he had genuine Christian faith, faith and yeah. not only that, he I, I I think that he he really knew um, how to reflect on these things in ways that were perhaps a little more nuanced than uh, most of uh, the establishment of his day. Um, which is, uh, you know, it, it's, it's funny, I said that things come and go. So in, in the 15th century with uh, um, the guy who wrote this book on the two books, uh, mm-hmm. Raymond Sabundus, um, people were much more relaxed about these matters than they were in Galileo's times nearly 200 years later. Mm-hmm. Um, so as I've said, the, these things come and go. It's sort of um, uh, every generation has to reinvent its own theology in, in, in certain ways. Galileo's letter to the Grand Duchess Christina is is a nice uh, read, on giving his, his view of that, and it, yeah, it's yeah. it surprisingly parallels a lot of what we talk about. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Here's an interesting uh, angle: um, Should an instructor's personal ideology, either religious or atheistic, be kept out of the science classroom, or is it a way of being truly honest about one's understanding? <laughs> Um, you might have a better perspective as yourself as, as actually teaching here at this university. I've done a lot of my teaching at a Christian institution where mm-hmm. I could be very open about my faith. But even, uh, and, yeah, I did some teaching at other ones, and I know a lot of people who do. Um, some who I see who model it well will, most professors will say something personal about themselves. You kind of introduce yourself on the first day and... Um, you know, here's who I am, here's where I'm from, here's my family and my hobbies. And mentioning your religious views or your worldview as a part of that, I think, makes a lot of sense. Um, it is a signal to students of where you're coming from, mm-hmm. kind of truth in advertising. Um, and, but then it should be kept out of that uh, for, for the most part. Um, there was a professor who wrote an op-ed in the New York Times a couple of years ago, a biology professor, I'm forgetting the name right now, but he talked about how he had the talk with his biology students every fall explaining, okay, come on kids, science shows there is no God. You really got to, you know, just give up on this religious stuff. And this was at a public university Mm. and just really not appropriate. Um, If a Christian professor or a Jewish professor would go in and say, okay, kids, now you all should believe in God because of this evidence, that would not be tolerated at all. So it, it should be kept somewhat out, but I think you know signaling a little bit is appropriate. Okay. Um, all right. You talked about dealing with the age of the universe. As a Christian and a scientist, how do you deal with the apparent tension between the theory of Darwinian evolution, the Genesis account of creation, and particularly the idea that humanity has been created in the image of God. This is, I, I don't know if the Vatican Observatory gets this question. We get it a lot at Biologos. Well, I, I'm, I'm sure um, it's um, a little bit different in Europe. Um, this, uh, the idea that um, again, <clears throat> the Darwinian theory of evolution somehow uh, contradicts scripture, contradicts faith, and even perhaps subverts it is, is really quite absent uh, in Europe. Um, so for me, it's, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's an interesting road of discovery over the last six years in, here in Arizona. <laughs> um, I would say that um, <clears throat> um, the answer to that question was already mentioned here before. Uh, I don't think that there's much to add to it. Um, Darwinian evolution, I think, is, is, a, is wonderful uh, from the point of view of uh, of faith because it shows you that matter has this innate ability and tendency to self-organize. It, it, it is just fascinating. Um, creation, um, I, I probably need to explain this from the theological point of view, creation is not about events in the past. Creation is a relationship. Uh, that's what theology tells us. Mm-hmm. Creation means that things need uh, some sustenance in their very existence to be, to continue to be. Um, You know, a little 
child usually needs to figure out one, uh, one thing among many um, growing up, and that is that uh, you know, if, you, if it doesn't see you for six seconds, it's still the same you when uh, he or she sees you again. Um, and and this, is, you know, this is not obvious. Mm -hmm. So there's something about the continuity of being um, that needs an explanation, on, at least on the philosophical level. In any case, um, this, is, <clears throat> this is not the main issue here. I think the main issue really is that um, the world was created with time, not within time. Um, this is an idea that, you know, I haven't come up with. This is, this is Plato's uh, dialogue, Time Years, that already contains this um, 2,400 uh, years ago. Um, the idea is very simple. Uh, God is eternal and lives in a timeless uh, state, which we call eternity. And the relationship to creation is something that transcends time. It transcends all um, space as well. It's, 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 it's bigger than that. So, um, you know, to, to have that perspective um, means that you, you, you stop asking silly questions about six days, etc. I mean, this doesn't make any sense whatsoever <clears throat> because creation did not happen in time. It is happening right now. God is sustaining us in existence right now mm. um, because for God, there is only now. That's beautiful. Um, but I'll address a few other aspects of this one, too. Um, I, so, so to build on that, a lot of people feel like if humans evolved, if we have common ancestors with animals, uh, that chimpanzee is my uncle kind of thing, um, <laughs> that that somehow is, is lowering of, of us. And the, um, the biblical teaching on being made in the image of God, that's a very powerful phrase. It doesn't show up a lot in scripture, so there's a lot of theological debate about what it means. But it is used there in that first chapter of Genesis to signify the uniqueness of humanity and how we are different from other creatures. So how can those fit together? But if you believe that God is the one sustaining this whole process, then it's not a question of, did evolution make humanity or did God make humanity? It's how God went about making humanity. So some people believe that God made humans with a special miracle. But if God made us through a natural process, is that any different? If we result in the same thing, God used a natural process to give us our capacities for intelligence and communication. And either way how God made us, you need God to be revealing himself to us. So God, some initial contact between God and humans that calls us out to be his image bearers, to fulfill this calling of what it means to be made in the image of God. So uh, Biologos is embarking on a, a project um, to explore this question more. What does human identity mean in light of the modern science, both of evolution and of um, other discoveries um, there's so many issues there with genetic engineering of embryos, artificial intelligence, transhumanism. What does it mean to be human? And there's a lot of interesting questions there. Mm. Um, wow. Um, I think we have time for one more question before our time is up here. Um, so to finish up, beyond those two questions that we just discussed, old universe and evolution, what are some of the other common questions and concerns that your organizations hear from scientists, from mm. Christians, and from the general public? Maybe I'll, uh, I'll start on this one. Yeah, sure. um, we get quite a lot of uh, rather funny misconceptions about what our role is. So people would think that perhaps we make horoscopes for the Pope, or <laughs> that we... Um, um, <laughs> Yes, we don't. Yes, we don't make horoscopes for the Pope. Um, that perhaps um, our primary concern is to figure out what the Star of Bethlehem was. Um, and there are many other misconceptions like that. And one in particular, which has been around in Arizona for the last um, five years or so, mm -hmm. is um, a lot of confusion about um, a name of an instrument on Mount Graham. Um, the instrument was... Uh, made and built by, by a group of German astronomers, 
for the LBT, the Large Binocular Telescope, which happens to be on the same mountain as our uh, Vatican Advanced Technology Telescope. Um, the instrument's name that they chose was a very nice little pun and a uh, um, little homage to a politician who helped them get the funding. Um, his name was Teufel, which means devil in German. So they called the instrument Lucifer. <laughs> now, that's, that would have been perfectly fine in Europe, but in southern Arizona, it's not. Um, <laughs> there are many people who were scandalized by that, and especially uh, when the confusion rose to another level, um, people started thinking, oh, um, in fact, it's the Vatican using a telescope called Lucifer. Mm. Uh, it's not a telescope, uh, by the way. It's, it's, a, it's a spectrograph, but that's neither here nor there. Facts don't seem to matter in, to people <laughs> like this. So we usually get these scandalized emails and uh, phone calls you know, about um, doing this evil devil's work um, and uh, how, how tragic it is that people so, so evil as us uh, happen to be so close to the Holy Father. Uh, it's, it's quite disconcerting sometimes. Um, so anyway, um, that's, we are not in the business of heralding the coming of an alien antichrist. That's not what we do. Um, I'm just uh, taking the advantage of, this op of and the opportunity here to say that again. So, um, so the, but when it comes to scientists, they, they usually very quickly, uh, once you start talking shop to them, uh, they, they, they forget entirely that there is mm -hmm. something strange about your affiliation. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Okay. All right. Um, I think we are unfortunately out of time today. Um, I'd like to thank our two panelists again. Let's uh, recognize them. Thank you so much. Thank you.